Bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening all. My name is Shubhashish Khoshal. I'm the director of TAISED, and I'd like to welcome you all to the seventh annual Chautier Symposium on Sustainable Engineering, Energy and Design, hosted in partnership with their sister institution, Institut de l'Energie Chautier at Polytechnique Montreal. 12 months ago, when we started planning this event, none of us expected that we'd be meeting in this format. But the coronavirus pandemic has not only changed the way we meet and interact with one another, it has given us, the world, a glimpse of what it would take through our collective ability to avert and mitigate a predicted looming climate change catastrophe. Our theme for this year's event is Lessons from a Pandemic, Solutions for Addressing the Climate Change Crisis. Tonight, we are asking, going forward, what can the COVID-19 pandemic teach us about addressing global climate change and how we researchers, professionals, and the public be active participants in transitioning our society towards a more sustainable future. Today, we hope to lay out a roadmap that can help us answer this question. With that, I'd like to now invite Professor Jim Nicell, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, to provide the opening welcome message on behalf of our faculty and McGill. Thank you, Sebastian. On behalf of McGill's Faculty of Engineering, welcome to the seventh edition of the Trotsky Symposium on Sustainable Engineering, Energy and Design, which has been made possible through the generosity of Lauren Trotsky and the Trotsky Family Foundation. Since its inception in 2012, the Trotsky Institute for Sustainability and Engineering Design has proven itself to be deeply committed to building bridges between researchers, providing student training opportunities in sustainability and engineering design, and engaging public policy discussions. This particular event has been a forum for highlighting innovative solutions to society's greatest challenges and for communicating those achievements to the public to facilitate this open dialogue that is so important. Well, for the last six months, with the emergence of the novel coronavirus, our global society has been living through one of the greatest challenges of our lifetime. As the pandemic continues to be a medical emergency in many countries around the world, including our own, it has really forced us to reinvent and adapt to how we function as a collective society. But what it's also done is it shone a light on another ongoing crisis, which is one of global climate change which is an emergency which is taking place, but on a very different time scale than the COVID crisis. But it's one that's already having important impacts around the world on us ourselves, both in the form of extreme weather events that are becoming more frequent in hotter and drier summers. And of course, in the wildfires that we're seeing in parts of North America and elsewhere in the world right now. Well, this whole crisis has led to a growing call from many of us in the environmental, in the economic and the financial communities to think about building back greener after COVID-19, to think about implementing new policies that will allow us to mitigate the event, the inevitable effects of climate change. But this call is being echoed by everybody in our McGill community, from our students, to our professors, to all our collaborators. Now is the opportunity to turn that into momentum for positive change. And just like in the COVID crisis, while we hope for medical, scientific, and technological breakthroughs that can bring us back to a state of pre-COVID normal, a similar effort is underway by many of the very same people or same disciplines to think about how we need to develop and implement technologies and designs that help us transition to a more sustainable, resilient and equitable future. And whether that takes place through novel renewable energy options or using tools like an artificial intelligence to design smart systems or increase energy efficiency or to reinvent our cities and our, our buildings or to redesign materials and manufacturing processes all these different things that will have to come together to make for a more sustainable world in the future. And that's what we're about, both in, in our Trotsky Institute and the Faculty of Engineering and McGill. So these promising advances that we're all working on are often not shared with a broader audience. So our goal through this symposium is to share with you some of the key discussions that have to take place to engage you in those discussions to see how we can work together to make a very positive difference for future generations. And very importantly to this evening, we have an opportunity to hear from experts 
to learn particularly about the ideas of how to overcome misinformation that is perpetuated by special interest groups and to communicate viable, factually rooted, scientifically substantiated solutions to climate change and to adapt adaptation and mitigation to climate change going forward. We need to figure out how to share that information and to help use that information to steer our collective action toward the development of a positive future for all of our societies. I hope that you learn a lot from tonight's discussions and that you enjoy the evening's program. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Naomi Oriskus. Naomi Oriskus is Professor of History of Science and Affiliated Professor of Earth and Planetary Science at Harvard University. She's a world-renowned geologist, historian, public speaker, and author of scholarly and popular books and articles on the history of earth and environmental science. In recent decades, she's been a leading voice on the issue of anthropogenic climate change. Dr. Oreskes is author or co-author of seven books and over 150 articles, essays, and opinion pieces. Her latest books include Why Trust Science. Her 2010 book, Merchants of Doubt, co-authored with Eric Conway, was the subject of a documentary film of the same name and has been translated into nine languages. Her 2004 essay, The Scientific Consensus on Climate Change, published in the journal Science, has been very influential and is very widely cited. Her numerous awards and prizes include the 2019 Geological Society of America, Mary C. Rabbit Award, the British Academic Medal in 2019 as well, and the 2014 American Geophysical Union Presidential Citation for Science and Society. She's a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and as well as several other prestigious academic and professional societies. It is our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Naomi Oreskes. Good afternoon. I'm Naomi Oreskes. I'm a professor of the history of science at Harvard University. I'm also an affiliated professor of earth and planetary sciences, and I'm the author of the book, Merchants of Doubt. For the last 15 years or so, I've spent a lot of time talking to people, to academics, to students, to the general public about the problem of climate change, about how what we know what we know, how scientists have worked on these issues for the better part of 75 years, how they have studied it from many different angles, and come to a consensus that man-made climate change is underway and that it is already having severe adverse impacts on human communities, on biodiversity, on our infrastructure, on our agriculture, and many other things. In the course of giving public talks, I often found that someone in the audience, after my carefully crafted historical talk showing how this knowledge had evolved over time, someone would stand up in the audience, usually a man, sometimes a little bit belligerent, put his hands on his hips and say, well, that's all very well and good, but why should we trust science? So as a professor and as a teacher, I've always known that I learn a lot from my own students. I always try to take my students' questions seriously, even if they sometimes seem like they're coming out of left field. And so I started to think, well, that's a question we should take seriously true. I don't think we should just assume that science is trustworthy and that we hand it over to people and say, here it is, like it or leave it, but that it's legitimate to think about why should we trust science? what is the basis for our belief uh, that science is in fact trustworthy? And as a historian of science who had also studied a fair amount of philosophy and been a working scientist at certain points in my life, I decided to take on that question. And so today's talk is my attempt to answer the question, why trust science? So in this first slide, you can see some examples of me giving public lectures uh, dating back to 20, 2004. I'm a little embarrassed at how young I look in that picture on the upper right hand side. Uh, but as I said, this book, this topic really came out of my own experience in talking to people, uh, the general public, particularly about the issue of climate change. 
And what I concluded from that work is that it's really not enough to simply say, trust us, we're experts. Our audiences, our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, our students deserve an answer to this question, an explanation for why science deserves our trust, if in fact it does. There's also another reason though that comes out of my own background as a scientist and a philosopher of science, which is the problem of scientific uncertainty. So all of us who have worked in science, all of us who have studied science know that even though the popular image of science is that it gives us facts and that scientific facts are these absolute definite things, things we know are absolutely positively true, the reality is actually much more complicated. We know that many scientific findings involve a certain degree of uncertainty, and there's two important reasons for this. One is that the word science itself is actually somewhat ambiguous. We use the word science to refer to two different things. On one level, science is the body of knowledge, is the body of scientific facts and theories that we have developed over the course of the history of science. But science is also a process. It's also the enterprise, the process of learning and discovery that leads to all of those facts and well-established theory. And so if science is a process of learning and discovery, then it means that we will learn new things in the future that will make us rethink what we know today. This is what I've sometimes referred to as the $64,000 question of the history of science. If we know that in the future, we may change our minds about some of the things we think we know today, then why should we trust current scientific knowledge if we know it may change? And what is the basis for believing that what we say we know now will in fact stand the test of time? Because not all of it will. The other problem is what we could call intrinsic uncertainty, that no matter what we do, no matter how hard we work, no matter how old the theory is, we can never say that something in science has been proven in an absolute sense. And again, this is partly because of the first reason, that we may learn new things in the future that cause us to rethink, but also because the world is in many ways probabilistic. When we talk about issues like climate change or disease, we don't know why one person smokes a pack of cigarettes a day and gets cancer and another person doesn't. There are intrinsic uncertainties. Things can be probabilistic, things can be stochastic. The weather is probabilistic. So even if our knowledge is very comprehensive, there will still be uncertainties in many of the things with which we have to grapple. And so for these reasons, scientific knowledge is never quite as hard and fast as many of us were taught it was in school. David Jurasky, the great historian of science who wrote the definitive book on the Lysenko affair, a rather dark episode in the history of science when scientists were pressured into accepting a theory that we would now say was completely untrue, or mostly untrue at least, once wrote, the world's scientific communities cannot claim absolute truth, but they can fairly claim that they are closer than anyone else to genuine knowledge concerning their particular fields of study. I think that's exactly right. I think Jurasky has really hit on what science really is about. It's about scientific communities who study a particular thing and work towards genuine knowledge. But how do we know that Jurasky is right? Can we reconcile the fact that science is inherently uncertain and subject to change with the claims that scientists are, quote, closer than anyone else to the truth, at least in their own particular areas of study? A third reason for writing this book and taking on this topic has to do with my work with my colleague Eric Conway in writing the book Merchants of Doubt. The major finding of that research, was, which was motivated by this question, why were some prominent people denying the reality of climate change? What we found was that the tobacco and fossil fuel industries had deliberately tried to create public mistrust in science, particularly science that showed the damaging effect of their products. But worse than that, to create doubt about science in general. Because if you're the tobacco industry and you don't want people to trust the science regarding tobacco, one very way, effective way to do that is to cast doubt on science in general. And so in our previous work, we documented in fairly copious detail uh, what exactly the, the industries had done and how they had done it. So for all these reasons and probably some others, it seemed to me important to take on this question, why trust science? What is the defense against the tobacco industry, against the fossil fuel industry, against just general confusion to answer that question? So I wanted to take the challenge seriously and do my best to answer it. <laughs>
Now, there's one more reason, of course, that has come to the fore in the last year. This book came out last October, so in some ways it was rather prescient because only a few months after it came out, COVID-19 hit. And I think if we needed proof positive of what happens when we don't listen to science, when we don't trust scientific findings, uh, you have only to look at the what's happened in the United States with COVID-19. The death rates, the damage to the economy has been much greater in the United States where our political leadership has disregarded scientific advice than it has been in countries like New Zealand or South Korea, where the leadership has done a much better job of attending to scientific evidence. All right, so let's look then at the problem of scientific evidence and the problem of uncertainty. For many historians and philosophers, when we talk about uncertainty, one of the things we think about is Pascal's wager. So as some of you may know, Pascal was a famous philosopher and mathematician who at one point in his life took on what he considered to be the most important question of all, namely, does God exist? Pascal posed what today we would think of as the problem of type one versus type two errors. That is to say, what are the relative risks of believing in God if he or she does not exist versus not believing in God if he does? And Pascal quickly concluded that it was better, definitely better to believe. If we believe in God and it turns out God does not exist, essentially no harm is done. But if God does exist and we don't believe in him, we will burn in hell for eternity. And so that's a pretty clear example of where the relative risks are much greater on one side than another. To put it into secular terms, you may not need it as you walk down the stairs, but it's generally better to hold on to the handrail. But this sort of idea, this idea of a leap of faith, of embracing the reality of God because it's less risky than rejecting it, can make it seem as if we're asking people to, to simply have faith in science. Sometimes it does seem, particularly to ordinary people, to the general public, that science is a kind of leap of faith, that we're being asked to trust scientists and we don't really know why. Most people, in fact, really don't have a basis for judging whether particular scientific claims are true. So if scientific experts tell us that COVID-19 is created by a novel coronavirus, most of us are not in a position to know whether or not that claim is true or false. And even many academics may not know how to judge claims in areas outside of our own expertise. Like Pascal, we typically assume that the risks of accepting scientific claims are smaller than the risks of rejecting them. And again, we've seen this clearly in the COVID-19 uh, case, where countries that did accept the scientific evidence have by and large done much better in containing the virus than those that did not. So in the case of COVID-19, it's pretty clear that those countries that have accepted the scientific evidence have done better overall. But what about more broadly? Should we trust science broadly? And if so, why? Is there a better or more comprehensive answer to this question than just the one example of COVID-19? I mean, that's a very powerful example. It's an incredibly important and timely example. But as a historian or a philosopher, I don't want to just have one example, or even as a scientist, I don't want to have just one data point. I want to have a lot of data points. So what is the broader argument for our confidence in scientific conclusions? Now, there is a traditional answer to this question, which many of you probably were taught in school, and that is, quote, the scientific method. That is to say, the argument has been presented that science is reliable by virtue of the method that it uses. And that method is typically said to be the hypothetical deductive method. So according to this theory, scientists develop hypotheses, they deduce the consequences of those hypotheses, and then they do something to test it, observing those consequences in the natural world or doing an experiment. And if those consequences turn out to be true, then we believe the hypothesis. Now, scientists sometimes do this, and there are some very famous examples in the history of science. My favorite example is the confirmation of the theory of general relativity by the deduction that if the theory were true, starlight would be bent in the presence um, of a massive body. And you could test that conclusion during a solar eclipse where you could look at the light coming from a distant star. So as you can see in this illustration here, the light coming from a distant star is bent as it goes past the sun. So during a solar eclipse, you could look at where the star appeared to be in the heavens compared to 
where you knew the star to be uh, and see whether it seemed to be moved. And in fact, this was done in 1918 by Sir Arthur Eddington, and it dramatically confirmed the theory of special relativity, sorry, the theory of general relativity. And so this finding was considered so significant, so surprising that it was actually written up um, in newspapers around the world. And this is an example from the Times of London. Now, sometimes this model of science is referred to as the deductive nomological model, mainly because academics like to use fancy words when ordinary ones will do, uh, but also because it conveys the idea that what we're really trying to do in science is not just develop hypotheses about particular or specific things, but to develop general theories, that is, or to say, laws of nature, to discover the laws of nature. So nomological means having to do with laws. So in an ideal case, then, we aren't just developing a hypothesis, but we're searching out a universal law of nature. But the idea is the same. We conceptualize a law, we deduce its consequences, and then we look for those consequences in the natural world. And the most famous example of this also involves Albert Einstein, the general law E equals MC squared. You can think of other laws you know as well, like F equals MA, or the universal law of gravitation, any of the things that we think of as laws of science. But there's a very, very big problem with the deductive uh, nomological hypothesis or theory or model of science. As a logical claim, it just actually doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of the problem of the fallacy of affirming the consequence. So we said that in the deductive nomological model or the hypothetical deductive model, we make a prediction and we see if that prediction comes true. But it turns out that just because a prediction comes true doesn't actually prove that the theory that makes the prediction is true. And the reason is simple. A false theory can make true predictions. So I can have a very elaborate idea about why it will rain tomorrow. I can claim that there are demons seeding the clouds and that will make it rain. And I say, well, if it rains tomorrow, it's because the demons seeded the clouds. Tomorrow it rains. That does not actually prove that my theory was correct. There could actually be many explanations for why it rains and mine is just one of them. The most famous example of this in the history of science is the Ptolemaic theory of the universe. So as many of you know, before Galileo and Copernicus, most people believed that the earth was the center of the universe. And the astronomer Ptolemy had developed a model to explain the motions of the planets as they moved around the earth on what were known as celestial spheres. The Ptolemaic system was very effective. It made accurate predictions of the planet's orbits. It made accurate predictions of eclipses. In fact, when the Copernican theory was first developed and introduced, the predictions of planetary motions were actually less accurate under the Copernican theory than they had been under the Ptolemaic. So today we would say that the Ptolemaic theory was false, and yet we know that it made many, many highly accurate predictions. So a false theory can still make true predictions. We cannot use the truth of a prediction as proof of the accuracy of the theory. The second problem, which is related, is the problem of auxiliary hypotheses. When we test a hypothesis, we're not just testing that hypothesis by itself in isolation, but we're also testing other assumptions that are built into the test. And we're testing the reliability and the sensitivity of our instruments. <clears throat> so again, to think about the Copernican theory, and or I should say the Ptolemaic and Copernican theories, when Copernicus came along and said, well, I don't believe that the Earth is the center of the universe. I actually think that it's the sun, and the Earth is actually a planet like the other planets, and all of the planets, including Earth, are moving around the sun. Various scientists said, well, if that's true, if the Earth is moving, we should be able to detect that motion. And so a number of ideas were proposed for how that motion could be detected. And one of the most powerful was the phenomenon of stellar parallax. People noted that if the Earth was moving, as Copernicus said, then it would be in a different position in June than it had been back in December. And so if we looked at a star, we chose some prominent distinctive star in the heavens that we could be pretty confident of 
identifying again come, come June, so Polaris or Sirius or any of the bright stars. If we look at that star in December, we would see it up against a particular backdrop of stars, uh, which we can see here on the slide. But if we were to look at that same star come June, we would see it now against a different backdrop. And the angle between the lines pointing towards that backdrop would be known as the stellar parallax. So it would be a number like two or three or four degrees. So astronomers looked for stellar parallax and they found nothing, nothing at all. And so for many astronomers in the 16th and 17th century, this was taken as refutation of the Copernican theory, even though today we would now say that in fact, Copernicus was right that the Earth was indeed moving. So what went wrong? Well, in hindsight, we can identify a very important auxiliary hypothesis. The assumption that the Earth's orbit was large relative to the distance to the stars, and that therefore the parallax would be large enough to be detected. Today, we would say that an accurate picture would be something much more like what you see in this slide, or even, um, you know, something like this, that the parallax is actually very, very, very tiny uh, because the stars are so very, very far away. So there was a faulty assumption about the size of the universe. We would say today that we know that the universe is much larger than scientists at that time thought. We can also point out uh, a second auxiliary hypothesis, which is the assumption that the telescopes that were available were sensitive enough to detect the parallax. Again, today we would say we know that it wasn't until the mid 19th century in the work of Sir William Herschel that telescopes became strong enough, sensitive enough to be able to detect the parallax. So today we know there is in fact stellar parallax. Uh, we can measure it easily with contemporary modern instruments, but this is now, you know, uh, 400 years after, after the idea was first proposed. So it took a long, long time to get to the point where we could do these measurements. But meanwhile, the Copernican theory, of course, had already been long accepted. So we might say that the hypothetical deductive model is an oversimplified picture of the scientific method. And in some ways that would be fair. It is oversimplified. The reality is more complex. But it's not just that it's oversimplified. There's another problem, and that is simply that a good deal of science just doesn't fit the hypothetical deductive model. That is to say, it's not what scientists actually do. It turns out that an awful lot of science, particularly the natural sciences like the earth sciences, botany, zoology, this science, a great deal of this science is inductive. So what does that mean? Induction is the process of generalizing from observation. So there are many scientists that are not primarily rooted in the laboratory, where scientists go out into the world and see things, whether it's geologists looking at rocks, or botanists looking at plants, or zoologists looking at animals. And through observation of the natural world, we begin to observe patterns, and we generalize from those patterns. And that process is known as induction. Now, in the mid-century, inductive science would be very criticized, and it would actually go out of fashion. So there are fashions in science, just as there are in clothing and everything else. And these fashions are sometimes very influential. The great physicist Ernest Rutherford dismissed inductive science as, quote, stamp collecting. And this was an idea that was promulgated by many North American physicists who made geologists and botanists feel bad about what they were doing, made them feel apologetic, and made them feel as if they had to change their science to be more like physics, to be more mathematical and more deductive. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that physicists' hostility to inductive science made many American scientists think that they actually needed to change what they did. Now, that was a project that, in my view, was, I, I write, wrote on the slide here, sometimes misguided. I think it was a project that actually was mostly misguided, because I don't think science works well by trying to imitate other sciences. I think that each science has to work out for itself what kinds of methods work best for the questions at stake. But we know for a fact that, among other things, this attitude contributed to the rejection of continental drift theory. In fact, what we know is that some of the most important work in the history of science has been inductive. And the most famous example of this is Charles Darwin, 
It's well known to historians of science that when Darwin went on the voyage of the Beagle, he did not know what he was doing. He did not have a theory. He did not have a hypothesis that he was testing. He didn't even know that he was going to work primarily on the problem of evolution. The only thing he really knew was that the sight of blood made him feel sick and he didn't want to be a doctor. And it was his failure as a medical student that gave him the idea that uh, he might be better off as a naturalist. Now, so induction and deduction are sort of the two main areas of scientific activity that historians and philosophers have focused on, because if we look at the history of science, we find a great deal of science, particularly up to the early 20th century, can be understood more or less as either primarily inductive or primarily deductive. But that begins to change in the late 19th and early 20th century, where another form of activity becomes important in science, and that's modeling. In the late 19th century, modeling was mostly physical modeling. So you can think of a physical model as a kind of experiment, except you're not exactly just, um, you know, it's not necessarily in the laboratory, and the model is an attempt to recapitulate some piece of the world, so to build a kind of miniature world uh, in a sense. So this slide shows the geologist Henry Cadell. You can tell he's a geologist because he's wearing a deer stalker hat and Wellington boots, and he's got his sledgehammer over here and a wheelbarrow full of rocks and sand and mud. And what he has done here is to construct a physical model, a scale mountain, of a particular phenomenon that had been observed in the Scottish Highlands and also in the Swiss Alps, the phenomenon of thrust faults and naps. So naps were a particular kind of fold, a large fold that in, um, in nature sometimes extended over hundreds of kilometers, in which you could see that the fold had been so folded so much that it actually folded back on itself. And in the center of these thrust fold, folds, you often found faults where the rocks had slipped along a relatively shallow, low angle fault plane. So this was a big mystery on a number of levels. First of all, we know that rocks are hard, they're solid. We have the expression solid as a rock. And yet these rocks appear to have behaved as if they were clay. And you can see that Henry Cadell has very conveniently for us written clay. So he's used clay to model the rocks because the rocks are behaving as if they were clay. And so he thinks that using clay might help us to understand what has possibly happened that could explain how rocks could behave as if they were clay. And what he's done here is to construct a plunger to compress these rocks from the side under the idea that if you compress rocks from the side, you could produce this sort of fault structure. And so this was an argument of a sort of a kind of plausibility argument, that if you could make a model that recapitulated what you saw in nature, then maybe the forces in the model were a kind of metaphor or an analog for the actual forces in nature. And this was an early argument for the importance of horizontal compression in forming mountains, an argument that later would be taken up by the advocates of continental drift and plate tectonics. Now, in the contemporary world, some people still do make physical models, but typically today when we talk about modeling, we're talking about computer modeling, also known as numerical simulation. In a numerical simulation, we do a kind of mathematical model where we use calculations to try to simulate what has happened in the world. This is an early model from an early uh, IPCC report that's looking at the question, what is driving the observed change in global mean temperature observed since the year 1900? So in this example, this solid black line represents the actual temperature record. So these are temperature observations from 1900 to 1990. And then these are the modeled results that most clearly match the observations. Down here are a set of different model results in which modelers have looked at particular elements of the atmosphere that we know have the potential to change the temperature of the globe and looked at in isolation. So here are sulfate aerosols, such as you might get from air pollution or volcanoes. Here you have volcanic dust, uh, which we know can affect the weather on the short term. Here we've got atmospheric ozone. Here we have changes in solar radiation. And here we have the forcing function of greenhouse gases, which were relatively modest at the early, early part of the 20th century, but begin to accelerate greatly starting in around 1960. And then they increase very dramatically towards the present. 
Well, this model shows us that none of these individual factors by themselves come anywhere close to the actual observed increase in temperature. But when we put them all together, in particular, the strong upward forcing of the greenhouse gases, then we can actually get a model result that fairly closely matches the observations. And so this tells us the observed increase in global temperature over the last century cannot be explained unless we have the greenhouse gas forcing function. So to sum this up, what we see from the history of science as well as investigations of contemporary science is that there are many different scientific methods. Scientists don't all do the same thing. The methods of chemistry are not the same as the methods of geology. And at different times and in different places, scientists have preferred different methods, choosing the methods that seem to be the right tools for the job. Because of this great diversity in scientific methods, the philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend, once said that the method of science is, quote, anything goes. Now, this has often been taken out of context to make it seem as if Feyerabend was just being facetious, and he may have been being a little bit, but the full quote actually better explains what he was trying to get at. The, he was, what the full quote was simply that if you are forced me, if you forced me, if you were to force me to tell you what is the method of science, I would have to say to you, the only method that doesn't inhibit progress is anything goes. In other words, scientists are creative. Scientists are innovative. And that methodological diversity is a good thing. And this is something that many scientists miss. In my experience, many scientists think that they are, even today, that they ought to be uh, doing something that at least approximates the hypothetical deductive model, or they ought to be doing something that has to be mathematical, or if they're in medicine, they may think that they must do randomized double-blind clinical trials. And of course, these methods all have very good arguments in their favor when they work, but there are many times when they don't work. And so because of that, scientists have to find the tools that work for their job. It's like you wouldn't think that you could have a toolkit that only had a hammer. So why should we think that scientists should have a toolkit that only consists of the hypothetical deductive model? So the recognition that scientific methods are diverse leads us to the question, do these diverse methods have anything in common? I mean, maybe the term science actually isn't very helpful. We really shouldn't be talking about science in a general way. We should be talking about biology and geology and mathematics and physics. Well, I think that these things do have something in common. I think the word science still has meaning. But I think the thing that's in common is not so much method as evidence, that all of these different sciences are all evidence-based, and all of these different methods are means of collecting, creating, and generating evidence. Evidence, then, is the key element in scientific knowledge, the key element that unites the diverse sciences, not method. But this then leads to another question. So who judges the evidence, and how do we even know what counts as evidence? Well, the answer, of course, is that scientists judge. It's scientists who decide what counts as evidence, but then how do they decide when they have enough evidence to say that something is known? And that's what brings us to the idea of consensus. In my own work, I have found that some people, particularly some scientists, especially for some reason physicists, I don't exactly know why that is, but some scientists resist this idea of consensus. Some scientists have a vision of scientists, science as a very individualistic activity in which a lone hero like Galileo can stand up to the forces of um, conventional wisdom and prove that everyone else is wrong. Well, that does occasionally happen, but those examples are famous in part because they are so rare. For the most part, what we call scientific knowledge is what scientists have come to consensus about. And even if we look at the rare heroic individuals like Galileo or Copernicus, we don't say that it became scientific knowledge until they persuaded their colleagues that they were right. So what this leaves us with is the recognition that what we call scientific knowledge is not just the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe, or the idea that the origin of species is to be found in evolution through natural selection, and not just the idea that continents move, but the body of knowledge that experts have agreed upon. <laughs>
It becomes scientific knowledge when Galileo or Copernicus or Alfred Wegener convinces his colleagues that these claims are correct. And he and his colleagues do that, or he or she or them do it through evidence. Claims that we call scientific knowledge are claims that experts have concluded are supported by enough evidence, sufficient evidence, to say that those claims are true. Claims about which experts have come to consensus. Now, as I've already mentioned, this troubles some people, maybe in part because it seems like an appeal to authority. So I want to argue that in some ways it is an appeal to authority, but it's a very particular kind of authority. It's not the authority of the individual, no matter how brilliant or wise. It's not the authority of Einstein or Darwin or Copernicus. Rather, it's the collective authority of scientific communities, of diverse experts who have weighed and judged the available evidence. And if you look at this picture, you see what are these people doing? They're looking at evidence. This woman in the foreground is showing them something, an image, a graph, some form of evidence that she thinks is informative. Now, I have to say, I'm always a bit suspicious that these people are actually scientists because they look way too happy. But, you know, there are some happy scientists out there in the universe. So to sum up, scientific knowledge is the intellectual and social consensus of affiliated experts based on the weight of available empirical evidence. This evidence is not generated and evaluated according to a single scientific method, but rather according to a set of diverse methodologies. And these methods have changed with time. However, by and large, the methods that we use, the ones that scientists rely on, are the ones that have stood the test of time. Scientific knowledge can be think, or scientific communities can be thought of as a jury of a certain kind, but it's a very special kind of jury, a jury of scientific peers. Other analogies, you can think about crowdsourcing, but again, a very specific kind of crowd, a crowd of expert geeks with PhDs. And of course, this is partly why the internet and social media has become such a problem for science, because now we have this proliferation of, of claims. We have crowdsourcing of claims, and we don't have a good way to judge how legitimate or valid those claims are. There's one more analogy that I have come to think is important, and it's one that sometimes surprises people because we think of science as leading to technology. We don't often think of technology as a model for science, but in a way I think it is. So if we ask ourselves, how did the modern car come to be so reliable? How did we go to, to a cranky, difficult piece of machinery that broke down all the time to the modern car where you can just get into your car put the key in the ignition, or maybe not even have a key, maybe just press a button uh, or turn a knob, and the car starts and off you go. Well, one of the things we know, one of the reasons for that, is that the modern car is not the product of the genius of a single individual, but rather it's the result of the collective genius, the collective work, the collective knowledge and effort of thousands of scientists and automotive engineers who have worked on the modern car to make it into what it is today. And science is like that too. So if we ask the question, why believe in science, why trust science? The answer is because our scientific knowledge is based on the accumulated expertise and experience, not of one or a handful of geniuses, but of many people working together. And it works, it functions, it runs, because like our cars, it runs because of the accumulated expertise and experience of all the people who have contributed to this effort. Now, this, of course, is a claim about science as a process. So I'm saying that we should believe in science as a process because by and large, it has worked well over time. We have cured diseases. We have learned that the continents move. We have explained uh, how evolution works and where hereditary information is transferred. We have put men and hopefully one day women on the moon using scientific knowledge and expertise. Put another way, we should not trust scientists as individuals, but we do have good reason to have confidence in the process of which they are a part. Now there is of course one more consideration. So I started my lecture with Pascal and I'd like to end with him as well because he did raise what I think is one of the most sensible ways of thinking about any problem that has ever been raised by anyone in the history of Western science. 
And that is the simple question, what are the relative consequences of accepting a claim if it turns out to be false versus rejecting it if it turns out to be true? And it, when, when it comes to the issue of climate change, the issue close to my heart and Mike Mann's heart, it is very clear that we should accept the results of climate science because if we don't, and our scientists are right, the consequences will be very, very dire. If, on the other hand, we accept the science and it turns out it was all a big hoax, well, then we will have created a better world for nothing. So to return us then to our present moment, if we think once again about the COVID-19 crisis, this is a sad and tragic but important lesson for all of us that the whole point of scientific knowledge is to understand the way the world works. And we never get it exactly right. Science is a process of learning and discovery. We will learn new things and that's a good thing. A year from now, hopefully we'll know a lot more about the coronavirus than we do today. But in any given moment, the best that we can do as humans is to act on the best available information that we have. And we've seen so clearly in the last six months that countries that have accepted the advice of their scientific experts and acted on that advice have not just protected their economy, but have protected the health, the safety, and the well-being of their citizens. Thank you, Dr. Oreskes, for that interesting perspective. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Michael Mann. Dr. Mann is the Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Penn State, with joint appointments in the Department of Geosciences and the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. He is also the director of the Penn State Earth System Science Center. Dr. Mann is author of more than 200 peer-reviewed and edited publications of many notable op-eds and commentaries and five books, which include The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy, and a children's book, The Tantrum That Saved the World. Dr. Mann was a lead author on the Observed Climate Variability and Change chapter of the IPCC Scientific Assessment Report in 2001. He contributed with other IPCC authors to the award of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. He's the recipient of many prestigious awards. And so to name a few, he was awarded the Hans Oesker Medal of the European Geosciences Union in 2012, the Climate Communication Prize from the American Geophysical Union in 2018, and the Award for Public Engagement with Science from the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2019. In 2020, he was elected to the US National Academy of Sciences. It is our privilege to welcome Dr. Michael Mann. So I wanna thank my hosts for inviting me to participate in this forum uh, in the Trottier uh, Symposium, which is you know, an opportunity to talk uh, about the crises and the challenges that we face today. Uh, we are uh, in an unprecedented uh, environment right now, a social political environment. We are dealing with the uh, challenge, uh, the crisis of coronavirus, COVID-19, and it actually provides us an opportunity to take stock, to take stock when it comes to the larger challenges that we face as a civilization. And so what I wanna talk to you uh, here today about is the even greater long-term crisis that we face in human-caused climate change and some of the insights, um, both that the current pandemic provides into how we go about tackling this crisis and, and some of the challenges that still remain in what I call the new climate war. Um, we are more or less now beyond the point where climate change critics can credibly deny that something is happening. Uh, that's the old climate war, as I call it, um, the effort to discredit the scientific evidence. As we move beyond that, because it just isn't credible to the public, uh, we enter into sort of a new realm, what I call the new climate war. Uh, the tactics that are now being used by the forces of inaction, fossil fuel interests, and, and those advocating for them um, in their effort to prevent us 
from transitioning away from our reliance on fossil fuels towards renewable energy. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you here about today. So let me talk about uh, how we win this new climate war. Uh, the plan, as I describe it, to take back our planet from polluters. Uh, it's also the title of my forthcoming book that'll be out in early 2021 about this challenge that we face. And let's start out by talking about the basic scientific evidence, the projections of the future. Now the critics like to dismiss the projections made by climate modelers, uh, climate scientists like myself as unreliable, um, is unvalidated. So let's forget that those projections even exist. And let's look at what ExxonMobil, the world's largest fossil fuel company, predicted back in 1982. In their internal documents, uh, we can find this graph, which as it turns out, almost perfectly predicted both the increase in concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning and the warming that would result from that. Within the error bars of the warming that's actually been observed. But what's so remarkable is that they were able to predict the increase in CO2 levels. And they were able to do that because they knew that they would be successful in their efforts to stymie policies to reduce our reliance on fossil fuel burning and the cause of the rising CO2 in the atmosphere. So what was really amazing here is that they knew that their policies and their business model would ensure that by 2020, we would be here at these levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and the warming that we've now seen. Now, if we had acted uh, decades ago, we would have had a fairly simple challenge uh, on our hands when it comes to bringing down our carbon emissions. We need to ramp them down to zero if we're to avoid crossing dangerous limits like a degree and a half Celsius, which is often looked at as the point where we really start to see the worst impacts of climate change. And we're potentially only decades away from that if we continue with business as usual. Now, if we had acted back two decades ago, uh, you can see we could have gently brought down those carbon emissions. It would have been uh, a, a, a challenge, but not a monumental challenge. And what decades of inaction have bought us is instead a much steeper decline. You can see how sharply now we need to bring down those carbon emissions uh, because of our, our failure to act. Decades ago, when we knew we had a problem, when scientists were telling us we had a problem, but fossil fuel interests like ExxonMobil were working hard to dismiss the evidence that we do have a problem. And the impacts are no longer subtle. We see them play out in real time on our television screens and our newspaper headlines. Wildfires are breaking out from the Amazon deep in the tropics to the Arctic, um, around the world, uh, unprecedented heat and drying uh, that creates the conditions for these disasters. Unprecedented heat waves now nearly every summer here in North America, uh, in Europe. January 2020 globally was the hottest month on record. We continue to see these records broken. Uh, this year may be the warmest year on record despite uh, having uh, no help from the El Nino phenomenon. Typically, we set records for the warmest year during El Nino years, whereas the, globing, the, the warming of the globe ramps up, that little extra push that it gets from El Nino puts us over that threshold and we get a new record. What's so remarkable is that 2020 might set a record without an El Nino event. And that tells us how profound the overall warming trend really is when it comes to the record heat that we're seeing globally um, and in Europe this summer, um, unprecedented heat once again. Uh, it's becoming a recurring theme. Uh, similarly here in the U Eastern US where I live. Um, and this August, we saw potentially the warmest temperature ever measured on this planet at Death Valley, 130 degree, the first reliable estimate of temperatures that high. So we are in unprecedented territory. And that heat and that drought, of course, gives us the wildfires that we've seen in recent years out west in California, and we're seeing them again this summer. And here back east where I live, uh, unprecedented damage from more intense weather events, like these derechos that we hear about, these very intense, long squall lines of uh, thunderstorms with hurricane strength winds that do massive damage. And there's increasing evidence that climate change is favoring the conditions behind 
those damaging events and hurricanes, tropical storms. Uh, this season, we're already on course to see potentially the most active season on record in the Atlantic when it becomes to the number of hurricanes we're likely to see. Um, we actually predicted that before the beginning of the season. There's some other groups like NOAA um, that are now uh, predicting as many as 24 named storms in the tropical Atlantic. Um, as I like to say here, call me old fashioned. I still think that a prediction should be made before the thing happens, uh, back in April before the beginning of the season. We predicted that active a season because of the unusual warmth we're seeing this summer in the tropical Atlantic. And that warmth is what provides the energy to grow and intensify these storms. Again, um, the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. We see them play out in real time every summer now, unprecedented floods and heat waves and drought and wildfires and superstorms. Some of that um, is related to uh, behavior in the jet stream, uh, new behavior that we're uh, seeing where the jet stream sort of gets locked into place and you get a big high pressure system, for example, that gets stuck out of, uh, that gets stuck out of uh, California, um, as we see here in the Western US, that ridge gives us high pressure, heat, drought, and the record wildfires we saw summer 2018. Whereas back east, you see that jet stream crashing down south. It's what we call a trough. You get a low pressure system that just stays in place for day after day, for week after week. And we got the wettest summer that we ever saw here in State College, Pennsylvania, where I live because of that. So these extreme weather events are favored by this unusual behavior in the jet stream that we're seeing. This behavior isn't really caught very well. It isn't captured in modern generation climate models yet. And so to some extent, the impacts that we're seeing are worse than what the models predict. The models may be underestimating the impact that climate change is having on these extremely damaging weather events that we're now seeing. Um, as I like to say, it's not rocket science. Climate change is behind these unprecedented damaging weather extremes that we are now seeing. Uh, I saw it firsthand when I went to Australia uh, this last December for a sabbatical, for what was supposed to be a five month sabbatical, studying the impacts of climate change on extreme weather events in Australia. And I arrived for what was perhaps the most profound example Australia has actually ever seen. Um, the bushfires, the massive bushfires of uh, summer 2019, 2020 in Australia. Unprecedented heat, unprecedented drought, and bushfires that spread out across the continent um, doing un, unprecedented damage to um, property and life and ecosystems, rainforests. Uh, it was like watching an apocalypse play out in real time. And I ended up spending my time there, my limited time. I ended up coming back early because of the pandemic. But the limited time that I did spend there, instead of doing research, I was spending that time talking about the impact that climate change is having, trying to help Australians connect the dots that this is the face of human caused climate change. It's not subtle. And we've just seen one degree Celsius of warming. Imagine what four degrees Celsius warming gives us because that's where we're headed if we don't do something about our ongoing burning of fossil fuels. Now, there are powerful interests who don't wanna see us uh, move beyond our addiction to fossil fuels. They've uh, profited uh, uh, for, for decades, uh, made record profits off of our addiction to fossil fuels, and they've fought tooth and nail to prevent us from making that transition. And my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Naomi Oreskes, um, uh, speaks uh, more to that in, in, in her work and in her lecture. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about these so-called climate wars, because I've found myself at the center of these efforts to discredit um, the science of climate change, uh, often by discrediting the science and the scientists themselves. Um, a few years ago, I spoke to uh, the uh, committee in the US House of Representatives um, the, uh, on science, the science committee, which was led by uh, Lamar Smith, a Texan who is well-funded by fossil fuel interests and denies that climate change uh, is real. And here's an exchange that I had with him. 
according to an article that came out a few days ago in the journal Science, uh, Chairman Smith was on record at the Heartland Institute. This is a climate change denying Koch Brothers funded uh, outlet um, that has a climate change denier conference every year. And uh, Chairman Smith spoke at that conference. Dr. Mann, don't mischaracterize that. Well, let me, let me finish uh, my... No, they do not say that they are deniers and you should not say that they are either. Well, uh, we, we can have that discussion. I'd be happy to. Let well, me finish be my accurate statement. in your description. Well, I, I stand by my statement. So can I finish my uh, uh, point? I'd like to reclaim uh, my time. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, he uh, indicated at this conference that he, according to science, and I'm quoting from them, he sees his role in this committee as to a tool to advance his political agenda rather than a forum to examine important issues facing the U.S. research community. As a scientist, I find that deeply disturbing. Uh, Dr. Mann, who said that? Uh, this is according to Science Magazine, uh, one of the most respected um, and, outlets and, when it comes and to And who science. are they quoting? Um, this is the uh, the author, uh, Jeffrey Mervis, who wrote that article. I, I'd be happy to send to committee the, okay. uh, the article. Uh, that is not known as an objective writer or magazine. Well, it's Science Magazine. Yeah, that so there you are um, in this sort of upside down black is white, up is down, uh, world of climate change denial, where uh, perhaps the world's most authoritative, uh, or one of the few most authoritative science journals in the world, science, um, is dismissed as unreliable. Um, that's the challenge that we face when it comes to climate change denial. Now, Lamar Smith is no longer chair of that committee. The Democrats have taken back in uh, the, the House of Representatives, and that committee is now led by a, a pro-science um, uh, uh, a, a, a pro-science pro committee chair um, who has actually uh, used uh, that opportunity to actually talk about the, the challenge and the threat of climate change and, and put us more on that path of having a, a meaningful conversation about what to do about it. Well, when I was down in Australia, I also came up against some hardcore climate change deniers, uh, in this case, a, a senator um, uh, from uh, a member of the Australian Senate uh, who is a well-known climate change denier. He and I were both panelists on a, a national uh, news program, and I'll, I'll play you a clip you from You said that. you get information across your desk every day yes. which leads you to doubt or be open-minded about the science. Yes. I am what is that information? It? Oh, it's, a, it's a range of information which goes... Mm. It's, it's a range of... Thank you. But, sorry, it's, we it's, just respectfully listen to this. Yeah, thank you. Just try to get to the bottom of this. What is what is the evidence that you are relying I'm on? I'm not relying on evidence, Hamish. I am saying. You said it. You said it. But, but this, is, this is why my mind is open. I would love to be convinced one way or the other. But to be prudent, what the government is doing is it's got a climate uh, uh, an emissions reduction policy and it is a good policy and it will mitigate risk to the maximum that it can and where risk cannot be mitigated it will it will adapt and and that's what we've got to work on is my yeah, yeah, come on now mate um <laughs> And, and he's an American. Now, um, you know, you should keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to this issue, when it comes to human-caused climate change, it's literally the consensus of the world's scientists that it's caused by human activity. Okay, so um, there you have it. Um, and that's a, a line, by the way, that was used by the great Carl Sagan, and I had an unusual opportunity to use it in that context. Uh, and it speaks to the fact that uh, you know skepticism is a good thing in science. We should be, uh, we should all be skeptics. But skepticism um, doesn't mean the indiscriminate rejection of the overwhelming consensus of the world's scientists. And it turns out that uh, this uh, episode got quite a bit of uh, attention publicly. Uh, it was covered in the, the major uh, newspapers. And what was uh, sort of uh, reassuring to see was the Australian media and public largely rejecting this sort of denialism because, frankly, they see the face of climate change. They were experiencing the crisis of human-caused climate change in a most profound way um, with the bushfires of summer 2019-2020. Um, and so it turned out it was an opportunity to actually help people understand that the impacts of climate change aren't far off in the future, they're here and now, this is a crisis.
uh, in fact, a great pandemic that we are facing right now in terms of its longer term impacts. So as the evidence becomes clearer and clearer and we see denialism sort of disappear, um, <clears throat> it's no longer really uh, accepted um, in polite company because the evidence has just become too obvious that something is happening. And so the forces of inaction who don't wanna see us transition away from fossil fuels have turned to other ways of trying to block progress. Um, uh, often it takes the form of what I call soft denial. Okay, well, climate change is real, but you know it'll be good for us. And we see that in the Murdoch media here in the United States and in Australia, um, uh, sort of uh, figures like Andrew Bolt, who uh, writes for a, a Murdoch uh, newspaper um, in Australia, who dismissed the, the bushfires as actually being good uh, for Australia, which is, of course, rather absurd on its face. Uh, the forces of denial, um, fossil fuel interests, brought in Bjorn Lumberg, who calls himself the skeptical environmentalist, although he's really neither, because skepticism in science should be equal-sided, and uh, he promotes uh, fossil fuel friendly uh, policies and attacks uh, policies to act on climate, um, policies to decarbonize our economy based on uh, misleading arguments uh, about the economy or dismissing the, the impacts, the damage that's being done by climate change. He's sort of famous for that. Um, and he was brought in by fossil fuel interests to Australia to try to convince Australians that uh, you know this really isn't a problem, this massive crisis that they're facing isn't a problem. You know, he has a new book out, uh, False Alarm, <laughs> where he continues to basically engage in what I would call soft denial, not rejecting the scientific evidence that the planet is warming, but in fact misrepresenting the impact that that warming is having, the impact when it comes to sea level rise and melting ice and extreme weather events and bushfires like we saw in Australia and wildfires like we see in California um, and the damage that that's causing. Uh, he dismisses that and uh, that work um, is promoted by conservative media, fossil fuel interests, uh, the Murdoch media empire in particular, because it leads us to the same place. Whether it's outright denial of the science or denial that it's a problem, it's still an argument for business as usual. And that's all the fossil fuel industry cares about, that we don't act. They don't care about the reason for that. Well, his, uh, his book was reviewed by uh, um, a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, uh, Joseph Stiglitz in the New York Times. And I'll just quote uh, you know, his summary. The book proves the aphorism that a little knowledge is dangerous. It's nominally about air pollution. It's really about mind pollution. Uh, Lumberg isn't alone. Uh, Michael Schellenberger, uh, uh, who's a, a founder of the so-called Breakthrough Institute, which is really aimed at purveying sort of the same messaging that climate change is real, but it isn't really a problem. And the best path forward is just to continue to burn fossil fuels and grow the economy. Well, then we see delay, right? Another tactic in the new climate war. Uh, well, all right, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem, uh, but uh, we can just adapt to it. We'll find ways to adapt to the impacts of climate change. We'll just kick the can down the road. And by the way, as we do that, fossil fuel companies, corporations conveniently continue to make massive profits if we delay action or we deflect attention <clears throat> from the real cause of the problem. And uh, here in the United States, when I was growing up um, in the early 1970s, there was a famous advertisement. Uh, it's called the Crying Indian uh, Public Service Announcement. And it impacted a whole generation, including myself. It was about uh, the, the impact that uh, pollution was having on our environment, the cans and, and, uh, and bottles that were strewn um, in our lakes, in our, uh, on, the, on the sides of our highways, um, the pollution problem that we had. And it advocated um, that uh, we take ownership of this problem, uh, that it's all about us being uh, better stewards. Uh, only you can solve this problem was the messaging of this advertising campaign. Now, in a sense, it sort of um, uh, 
felt uh, empowering, a whole generation of us who felt like we were more aware of environmental pollution uh, because of this advertisement. But it turns out, ironically, it was actually a very clever propaganda campaign by the beverage industry, by Coca-Cola, working with ad executives on Madison Avenue uh, to create an entire campaign that would deflect attention away from the need for systemic solutions like bottle bills that would put a deposit on bottles and cans that would require industry to process that refuse. It would cost them more money, but um, it would clean up the environment. Uh, they didn't like the idea that they would have to um, pay for that, that they would have to be subject to regulation. So instead, they ran this massive advertising campaign to convince people that the problem wasn't corporations, it wasn't the soda, um, you know, it wasn't Coca-Cola or the beverage industry, it was individuals. Indi we're not just, we're not being good enough stewards of our environment. And if we could just be better stewards of our environment, that's the way to solve the problem. It was a clever way to deflect attention away from policies that would regulate them and force them to actually do something about that. <clears throat> now, as a result of that, we now have as one of our other greatest global environmental crises, global plastic pollution. Thanks to the success that the beverage industry had in blocking policies to solve this problem systemically. And we're seeing the same tactics used today by the fossil fuel industry, um, often uh, promoted. Uh, they get a helping hand from mainstream uh, media outlets like the New York Times, which constantly emphasize the role of our food choices, our diet or our travel habits, our lifestyle, as if this is the primary means for addressing the climate crisis. Now, individual behavior is important and we should all be better stewards of the environment. Um, <clears throat> but the idea that it's all on us is very convenient to fossil fuel interests who want to fight efforts to put a price on carbon, to incentivize the shift away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. They want to shift the conversation to our behavior rather than their behavior, just as the beverage industry did in the past. And it's been fairly successful. They've had uh, quite a bit of success in really creating this larger media narrative that it's all about eating meat and not flying, um, which in reality would make a small dent in our carbon emissions without needed systemic changes. And this is something that I've often opined on. Yes, we should um, all be uh, better stewards of the environment. We should try to minimize our, our carbon footprint. Um, there are things we can do in our everyday lives that make us healthier, they save us money, they make us feel better. So why wouldn't we try to do that? Uh, but that those changes alone aren't going to get us the reduction in carbon emissions we need if we're to avert catastrophic warming of this planet. We need systemic change. Um, and we see the media, uh, the Murdoch media, for example, attacking uh, progressive politicians um, in Australia over the fact that they still fly. Uh, the mayor of Sydney, for example, was attacked by the Murdoch media in Australia um, for um, her administration um, and the fact that they still uh, you know, engage in air travel, as many of us do, as we still work within the system that exists. And what I loved is that in her response um, to those attacks, she actually cited uh, a lecture that I had recently given in Sydney on the new climate war and on this deflection campaign. Um, that is being used to steer attention away from the need to rein in the fossil fuel interests that have such a cozy relationship with the Murdoch media and to make it all about individual behavior and to make it all about shaming leaders in the climate movement like Al Gore or Leonardo DiCaprio, to make it all about their lifestyle and their supposed hypocrisy to deflect again away from the fact that we're not going to solve this problem without systemic change, without a price on carbon, without policies that incentivize a shift away from fossil fuel burning. Uh, they also seek to sow division online. A part of uh, the new climate war is to divide progressives, to divide climate activists, to get them fighting over their personal choices over whether they eat meat or not, or uh, whether they engage in air travel. If they can get us fighting with each other, then we don't represent a united voice calling for change and challenging the status quo. Uh, we see that even with filmmaker uh, Michael Moore, who's uh, 
known as a long-term sort of uh, progressive firebrand um, uh, uh, who um, you know has been uh, arguing for progressive causes for decades, but himself now has played into this this campaign of deflection, uh, deflecting attention from the need to uh, move towards renewable energy. Uh, his most recent film, Planet of the Humans, actually attacks the renewable energy industry. It attacks leaders in the climate movement, like uh, Bill McKibben, my good friend Bill McKibben, and it tries to divide us. Um, now, why Michael Moore chose to do that is anybody's guess, but it does play very readily into the, new, the tactics of the new climate war, these efforts to divide the community, um, getting us fighting over our uh, individual behavior, for example, and um, engaging in despair mongering, um, arguing that there's really nothing that we can do about the problem. And I'll talk about that in a moment, doomism. So another path towards inaction is getting people to give up, um, uh, leading people to despair um, and to defeat, um, convincing us that there's nothing we can do. We've already passed the point of no return because whether you're denying the sound, science outright or you're denying the possibility of agency that we can actually do something about the problem, it leads us down that same path of inaction. And so it's been very useful for the forces of delay for the inactivists, as I call them, the fossil fuel interests trying to block progress, um, to try to actually um, engage in doom mongering, despair mongering, um, convincing environmental activists that it's too late to do anything. So why do anything about that? And we have cult-like figures like Guy McPherson, um, ostensibly on the environmental left, but who actually has um, promoted the idea that it's too late to do anything, that human beings will be extinct within 10 years, no matter what we do. So we might as well just enjoy going down with the ship. Um, that is a very destructive messaging. Uh, first of all, it's wrong. There still is agency. We still can avert the worst impacts of climate change. And one of the greatest threats to actually doing so is the belief that it's too late to do anything. And it's not surprising that his messaging is actually promoted by conservative media outlets. Um, it's not surprising that he posted an article that actually supported the candidacy, candidacy of, uh, of Donald Trump because it would somehow further this necessary purge um, as uh, it was described, um, to quicken the demise as it was described in an article he posted on his website. And again, um, his, uh, his videos are often uh, promoted by a website that advocates for various uh, conservative conspiracy theories, supports Donald Trump and Republicans. Um, maybe that's not coincidental. Uh, but this sort of messaging has reached uh, into the mainstream media. Um, the New Yorker, uh, New York Magazine published articles uh, sort of promoting doom and gloom and overstating the scientific evidence. Um, to the point of, of misrepresenting it, making it sound like catastrophic um, runaway climate change is now locked in. It, it's not. The science tells us it's not. And messaging that suggests it is, is very destructive. So finally, what can we do to win this war, um, the new climate war? Well, we convey urgency because there is great urgency. We do have to act now, immediately. We've seen that. And we have to make substantial progress over the next decade um, if we're to avert catastrophic warming. But there is agency. There is still time to put in place policies that will actually do something about the problem. Uh, we know what the solution is. We don't need a miracle. The solution is already in front of us uh, in the form of renewable energy. Uh, we simply need policies that will greatly accelerate the transition that is already underway away from fossil fuel burn, burning towards renewable energy. Um, the latest data suggests that we're turning the corner. We're seeing a flattening of carbon emissions. Uh, the International Energy Agency in their 2019 report uh, showed that CO2 emissions had flattened uh, in 2019. And for the first time, they were able to actually establish that that flattening was due to the increased market share of renewable energy that the global investment in renewable energy, the shift that's underway, away from fossil fuels, is now 
helping us turn the corner. It's flattening those carbon emissions. Now that's not enough. As we saw before, we've got to ramp them down dramatically, bring them down by a factor of two within the next decade if we are to avert uh, catastrophic one and a half degrees Celsius or greater warming. But there is time to do it. And we're seeing some evidence that we're turning the corner. We just need to accelerate that transition that's underway with appropriate policies. Um, ironically, the pandemic, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, um, as awful as a crisis as it is, and tragic with the, the massive loss of life we've already seen, um, if there is a silver lining, it's that it's allowed us to take a step back and, and sort of look at our vulnerability um, and reconsider sort of our modern you know, energy economy, um, our modern way of doing things, and ask some deeper questions about sort of sustainability, uh, about resilience, about how we can continue to live with nearly 8 billion people uh, on a finite planet with finite resources. Um, we're, start, we're actually seeing the opening of a window of opportunity to have some of those conversations. And interestingly enough, we've seen fossil fuel energy um, take a hit and renewable energy actually prosper in this environment. Uh, that will almost certainly lead to a substantial decrease in carbon emissions in 2020. So not only will they be flat, we will actually see carbon emissions drop probably by about four to 5% this year, global carbon emissions, the largest drop that we've seen uh, on record. Um, and that's good news. Um, and I'll come back to that. The other good news is uh, the youth climate movement. Um, Greta Thunberg, um, who has sort of awakened uh, the world to you know, the, the threat that climate change poses to her and her generation and future generations, and has helped recenter this conversation where it always should have been not just on the science or the economics or the policy or the politics, but the ethics, the intergenerational ethics of not degrading uh, this planet for future generations. It's really changed the conversation. And that's an important reason that, um, you know, if, if you look at sort of the reasons for cautious optimism, the impacts have become so profound that we can no longer deny them. Uh, you know, hardcore denial is, is disappearing. Um, we see this rise of acti uh, activism uh, among our youth that has reawakened uh, uh, the conversation about climate change and what to do about it. Greta Thunberg has been dismissed by um, OPEC, the world's uh, largest uh, fossil fuel consortium, um, has dismissed her and her fellow youth climate campaigners um, as the greatest threat that they face. That's really remarkable. The greatest threat that the fossil fuel industry faces is these kids because they speak with such moral authority and clarity and they're changing the conversation and they've recentered our entire discourse over climate change, creating all sorts of opportunities for action. And we have to be out there, not just supporting them, but making sure uh, that we do our part. We don't just leave it on them to solve this problem. Uh, we have to do our part. Um, we are in a position to vote and to um, influence the, the policy uh, uh, policies on uh, climate action in a way that they're not. And we need to take responsibility for that. Now I'm gonna play a, a clip here from uh, our president, uh, Donald Trump. So Obama's talking about all of this with the global warming and that, and a lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. You know that, right? Coronavirus. And this is their new hoax. Today, the World Health Organization. All right. So <laughs> I actually think that's good news. Um, Climate change is much more subtle to many people. The impacts aren't so immediate. But when our president similarly dismisses coronavirus as a hoax, when people know friends and family members um, who, who have and, 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 and public figures who have died uh, from this pandemic, um, it suddenly opens our eyes to the real danger of denial, um, the real threat, the deadliness of denial. And I think it's actually, again, changed the conversation um, where we recognize now that we can't dismiss these threats as hoaxes. They're real. And it's all too evident uh, with coronavirus. Um, it really helps steer the conversation 
away from the old sort of denialism towards the more meaningful conversation about what we do about this problem. Now, as I said, we saw carbon emissions fall in the immediate wake of the lockdown and the social, social distancing policies in sort of February, March. Uh, we saw global carbon emissions drop 17% um, at their peak. But by the time the year is over, um, and the economy, as it comes back, we'll probably only see about a four to five percent decrease in carbon emissions. And what that tells us is that individual changes, even these massive changes in our lifestyle and behavior um, over the past several months in response to this pandemic, that alone isn't enough to solve this problem. If we're going to get the reductions that we need, which means more than five percent a, a reduction in carbon emissions year after year for the next decade and beyond. That's what we need to do to avert a catastrophic one and a half degree warming. Um, you know, simple changes in behavior and lifestyle aren't going to do it. We need policies that are going to incentivize a massive and immediate shift away from fossil fuel burning. Um, and there's some reason to believe that we might be around the corner here in the United States in this next election from being in a place where we can actually advance those policies and move in the direction that we need to move. And so I'm cautiously optimistic for all the reasons that I've talked about that we will prevail in this new climate war. And in the end, you know, it's about our children, our grandchildren, what sort of planet we wanna leave behind for them. That's my daughter. We just saw the Great Barrier Reef when we were down in Australia late last year. Um, and it was heartbreaking to know that it might not be there for, for her and her children and grandchildren if we don't act. Um, so it's all about the urgency and the agency. We can still save that future for our children and our grandchildren and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mann, for that very interesting talk. We will move in now to a discussion and Q&A session, which will be moderated by Dr. Bruce Lowry. Dr. Lowry is president of the IV Foundation and adjunct professor at the School of Policy Studies, a senior fellow at the Institute for Sustainable Finance, both at Queen's University, and is also a visiting lecturer at the University of Oxford Social Finance Program. He's a board director of several organizations, including the new Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, the Transition Accelerator, and the Seed Change Foundation. He's a former director of the Ontario Trillium Foundation, Environmental Defense, and many other organizations. Dr. Lowry has played a pioneering role in connecting environmental issues to human health, most notably with his leadership in the phase out of coal-fired power plants in Ontario, the single largest climate action in North America. Bruce has co-authored several best-selling books, including the internationally acclaimed Slow Death by Rubber Duck. He's the founder of Summerhill Group, one of Canada's leading energy efficiency consultancies. Dr. Lowry is a member of the Task Force for Resilient Recovery, formed by independent and diverse group of Canadian finance, policy, and sustainability leaders with the goal of coming up with tangible solutions for governments to help Canadians get back to work, while also building a low carbon economy in the post COVID era. With that, please welcome Dr. Bruce Lowry. Well, thank you so much, Shabasis. And uh, thank you also to McGill and the Trottier Institute for hosting the evening um, tonight. Um, it's a tremendous honor for me to be here with Naomi and Mike um, and listening to their um, really fascinating and, and tremendously important presentations. Um, listening to Naomi was a, a flashback to my own dissertation on the history of science and uncertainty and doubt. So um, really, really um, great for me. And one, one of my observations, I'll take a few remarks before we get into a conversation and questions. Um, it, it didn't uh, dawn on me until hearing your presentations that the three of us have backgrounds in geology and earth scientists, uh, earth science, and somehow um, we've all morphed into climate 
and um, and science activists um, in our in our later careers. So uh, I've I've always thought there's something about geology that helps you understand how the entire world functions, and it's a it's a way of thinking that maybe is a little broader from some of the more siloed sciences. But that's my my bias as a geologist. Um, so, you know, we've we've touched on a number of very, um, I think, critical and, and incredibly timely subjects. Um, we have one rule in Canada where we try to never talk about Donald Trump, but I'm afraid that we might break that rule tonight. Um, but we've seen in your presentations the, you know, the the um, you know uh, unequivocal evidence of climate change. How science now is clearly um, I mean, it has been for many, many years for those of us working on it, but there clearly is no doubt. I would say the public largely is behind the science um, on this. And, and yet we still have challenges, I would say, within the politics of climate change, more than within the public and more than within science. And certainly, uh, you know, from our perspective in Canada, where we uh, depend a great deal on the United States for for trade. We we receive a lot of information through, you know, television and other, you know, other media these days. I guess from the United States, um, and for us, it's always somewhat of a an exaggerated state of divisiveness, hyperbole, drama, um, politics. That th you know, thankfully for us, it's it's never quite that extreme. But I think we have a lot to learn from how things can get um, you know, quite out of hand when you have corporate interests influencing democracy and politics and, um, and politicians who, as you pointed out, um, Mike, in your presentation, they no longer, they blatantly no longer represent the public interest. They, they represent private interest. So we're gonna touch on some of those um, uh, issues and, and questions have come come to me uh, through through McGill on on some of those things. Um, I think we also want to make sure that we don't get too depressed uh, around where we're going. And so, um, a number of people have asked questions around, you know, where are the most promising opportunities? Um, where should we be making the greatest investments in our future? And I would note that. Um, in addition to this being a very special day because of this event, it's also um, the day that the Task Force for a Resilient Recovery in Canada, which I've been um, quite a significant part, has released its final report. And I think it's a very positive report that identifies um, um, you know, five big things that we need to focus on in terms of making buildings more efficient, building out um, an electric vehicle economy, looking at clean technology, focusing on nature solutions, and basically building out competitiveness around, uh, around the clean economy. And so um, I want to make sure that we can touch on some of the things that you think are, are um, areas where we can be optimistic going forward. Um, and then um, I think the other the other area that I'm seeing more in our work is this idea that um, you know, whereas I would say even in my own work ten years ago, it seemed like there were so many things that we needed to do to deal with climate change, and it was complex, expensive, um, and um, and difficult to really sort through what the priorities were. And through partly through our exercise um, with the task force and also other work we've been doing, and and I'd like to maybe I'll start this um, start our conversation with each of you on this idea that um, you know are there several big ideas that we really need to focus our effort on globally, um, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'll just raise a few examples from our work. So you know we're seeing electrification broadly as a big feature. We're seeing um, hydrogen as playing a role somewhere in all of this, perhaps you know, not, not as big a way as electrification, but still there. We're seeing nature-based solutions um, as another piece. We're seeing carbon technology, uh, carbon capture, uh, direct air capture um, as well. Um, maybe I'll, um, I'll start with you, Naomi. Do you, are there, would you say there are things that you think we're converging on globally that are some of the um, the major solutions, the investments that we really should be betting on? I think largely, yes. I mean, everything you've just said, certainly electrification powered by renewable energy is crucial to this. 
electricity storage that we can maximize the potential of renewable energy, uh, smart grids, demand response pricing, all those uh, technological and managerial innovations that will make us be able to use renewable energy in the most effective way possible. I think we do have a technical consensus on that. I think we've had that for a long time. And you know, you said we, we have to look for some good news because this is frankly a pretty bad news story. Um, you know, that is the good news. The technology that we need exists. It doesn't have, we don't need a miracle. We don't need to sit around waking, waiting like a cargo cult for some, you know, thing to be delivered uh, from on high. The technology we need exists and it is cost competitive. Uh, renewables are now more uh, cost competitive, cheaper in many parts of the world than, than fossil fuels are. So that's the good news. But uh, there's some pretty serious bad news too that we have to confront. And I think if we only talk about the technology we can give people a false sense of security. And the bad news is the continued political power of the fossil fuel industry, particularly in the United States, but also in Canada. I mean, Alberta, you know, it's like a emotional roller coaster watching what happens in Alberta, just like it is watching what happens in Australia. You know, a lot was good that was happening there. And now there's a lot of problems again, uh, same in Australia. The, the political winds blow in ways that stand in the way of us adopting the technologies that already exist. And until we can address that issue, we can have the best technologies in the world. We can have the most perfect technology. We know from the history of technology, it's not enough for a technology to be better. We have many examples in history where superior technologies don't get applied because of political forces or because of inertia, social forces, technological lock-in. And unless we address those as well, as a kind of both end problem, I don't believe that we will be able to solve this problem. Great, great. Thank, thanks very much, Naomi. And we're, in fact, another initiative that both, um, just to put a plug in, the Trottier Foundation and the Ivy Foundation are involved in in Canada. It's called the Transition Accelerator, which is really looking at how do you how do you um, bring together that kind of the broader socio-technical, cultural, and political aspects to um, uh, to these transition pathways and the technologies that we need. So, um, so thanks very much for that. And um, um, Mike, can I ask you the same question? Yeah, and I won't retread the same uh, ground that's already been covered here, uh, other than to say that, you know, as I showed in my presentation, there is some uh, moderately good news. We've seen carbon emissions uh, flatten last year. Uh, they didn't go up at all. And in fact, if you look at the energy sector, there was a decrease in carbon emissions in the energy sector. And for the first time, the IEA was able to say it wasn't because of an economic slowdown or anything else. It was because of uh, renewable energy and the fact that there is a transition, a green energy transition that is already underway. Um, as uh, Naomi alluded to, the problem is that that transition, while it's underway, while it's happening, isn't happening fast enough because there are special interests and really a small number of petrostates right now that are basically spoiling it for everybody else. A small number of petrostate bad actors, and you can name them, uh, the, the United States under Trump, um, Australia uh, under Morrison, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and together um, they have been able to sabotage, for example, the last uh, major climate conference. They were able to uh, sort of throw enough gum in the works to prevent uh, an agreement that would have really built substantially on the Paris Agreement. Um, and so what we're also seeing, however, is that there does seem to be some movement away from that. And this will be a test uh, within 60 days. This experiment will have played out in the United States and we will know the result of this experiment. Did we look into the abyss and decide that this is not the direction that we wanna go in? And did we elect policymakers who have climate plans ready to go on day one? Because that's where we are. If Democrats take back both houses of Congress and the presidency, um, the problem isn't uh, the absence of a climate plan, it's too many climate plans. Congressional Democrats have one, uh, rather, Senate Democrats have one, House Democrats have one, the Biden campaign has one as well. And so there's reason to believe that we could hit the ground running. We could see in the United States, um, you know, an acceleration of that transition. Uh, the Trump administration has done a lot of damage. They have dismantled some of the progress that was made under the previous administration, um, the Clean Power Plan, the uh, you know uh, methane emission standards, uh, 
automobile efficiency standards in all of these sectors. They've basically slowed things down, but there's enough progress happening at the state level, the municipal level, what companies are doing, that we've made progress. And if we get, you know, in, in you know, in both Congress and the United and, and the presidency, uh, policymakers who are ready to act, then then we can see the United States retake leadership, uh, regain leadership on this issue, and set an example for the rest of the world. Bring in the other partners, put pressure on those remaining petro states that uh, continue to try to block international progress. So I'm, I'm optimistic because a number of things are aligning. Um, the fact is you can't deny the impacts of climate change because all you have to do is turn on your television to see them. Uh, the fact that we have recentered this conversation on basic issues of ethics. What sort of world do we want to leave behind for our children and grandchildren? There is a rebirth of <laughs> activism in the United States. We have been, you know, we're, we're going through a tipping point, a tipping point moment right now on issues of racial justice, and I think we're very close to that tipping point moment on climate as well. So there are a number of things that are coming together if the U.S. election goes the right way, um, in a way that's favorable for climate action. Um, then all of those things suddenly align, and I think we will see an acceleration of that decarbonization uh, that we know has to take place and has to take place rapidly. So there is great urgency, as we all know, and time is running out, but there is agency. There are opportunities here uh, to make substantial progress. It's all up to us. And here in the United States, you know, Canada's much farther along. You, you have a price on carbon. You have a commitment to climate policy at the national level. We don't have that here in the United States, um, but we could. It's all up to us. It's all up on you know, it's all on Americans to come out and vote and vote on this issue. It's the greatest crisis we face. Coronavirus isn't the greatest long-term crisis we face. Climate change is. And that has to be the issue that Americans vote on in under two months. And if it is, then I think there is reason to start to be optimistic that we're going to, um, we're going to round the curve. We're going to bend that curve downward. And we are going to put ourselves in a position to avert catastrophic warming. I think the alternative would be a global depression of a different kind. <laughs> well, if, if Trump uh, gets another four years, as I said just the other day on MSNBC, um, that spells trouble for the planet. We can't afford another four years of Donald Trump. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you'll get. Um, we, we've we've long thought that you should include Canadians in your um, in your voting strategy because you would you would get a whole lot more Democrats on board. Um, but um, I, I'm going to just follow up. Um, you, you mentioned carbon pricing, and uh, we did have a question on that. So you know, it, it's it's been one of the things that has uh, been, uh, you know, without the same degree of divisiveness. But in Canada, the carbon pricing and carbon tax has been uh, kind of a, a left-right divisive debate, and it looks like we now have um, a new leader of our Conservative Party, Aaron O'Toole, who is. Um, you know, at least somewhat, you know, favorably predisposed to um, to the idea of market mechanisms and pricing. Um, where do you see that globally, or are you, um, in terms of like, you know, the idea of, you know, if we're going to invest political capital, time, energy, is carbon pricing something that you would each look to as as an important policy tool? Did you want me to go first, and then Naomi, or uh, Naomi, did you want to? I'm happy. Yeah, Naomi, can, oh, either of you. Well, you know, I think this is a really complicated issue. And, the, and my thinking on this has changed a bit. So 20 years ago, Michael, remember this, you probably remember too, a lot of economists were pushing carbon pricing in part because they were saying that it was the simplest solution, right? That climate change is a market failure. The market doesn't account for the external costs, the social cost of carbon. There's all this damage. But if we could just make the price accurately reflect the true cost, internalize the externalities, as economists say, then that would go a long way towards solving the problem. And particularly because it would level the playing field so that fossil fuels, which appear to be cheap, but weren't really, would then become more expensive and that would make it easier for renewables to compete. So that was a very good argument. It was a very logical argument. I accepted it. Practically every person I know who was involved in this issue did. But there was one part of it that turned out to be wrong. And that was the easy part, 
right? It was supposed to be easy because it was rational and it was supposed to be easy because, because it was a market mechanism, conservatives and business leaders, we were told would accept it because it wouldn't involve a major government intervention. It wouldn't involve command and control. It would not involve the federal government telling businesses how to run their shop. Well, that all made total sense. And yet it's not what actually happened, right? Turned out we couldn't get a carbon price either. And we actually couldn't get most business leaders on board. We got some on board, but we certainly couldn't get the fossil fuel industry on board. And there was never really a groundswell of support for it on the part of conservatives or business leaders. And every time we thought we were getting close to it, uh, the Waxman Markey bill being the most important example, in the end, Republicans in Congress wouldn't support it. The majority of powerful business leaders wouldn't support it. I mean, some did, but most didn't or not enough and failed. And so this is a really interesting dilemma then to say, well, we could keep talking about carbon pricing as the rational, sensible, easy solution, but obviously it's not easy. It's not easy politically, even though it seems like it should be. It certainly seems like it should be easier than other things which we understand why conservatives would oppose. So now that that's all happened, now I feel like, I don't know. I don't really know if carbon pricing is really the best way to go. I think it's a tool. We have many tools at our disposal, but given how little time we have left, I tend to think now that at this point, um, I would agree say, for example, on this point with Naomi Klein, even though I may disagree with her about other things, that we need things that are more direct, like direct investment in renewables, direct government investment. Because the other problem with carbon pricing is it will work, but only if the price is very stiff. It's got to bite, it's got to hurt, because if the price isn't high enough to hurt, it won't influence how people behave. And of course, the political challenge of getting a meaningful price, a price that would really bite, is a giant challenge. And so the alternative, just think about direct government investment in renewables, direct government investment in the infrastructure to support a renewable economy, such as integrated grid. Um, it was the US government that built the electricity grid in the United States in the first place, governments that built the grids in most parts of the world. So rather than looking to the private sector to do the right thing with an incentive, maybe we really do need to go back to some solutions that we previously rejected as too hard and say, well, you know, time has run out and we can't really afford to take the time to do something that's going to be indirect. So I'm on the fence about this. Certainly if someone came up with a bill that had bipartisan support and could pass quickly to implement a carbon pricing system, I would absolutely be all for it. But I think we have to be really, really careful about continuing to push this argument that has actually failed us for 20 years. All right, so I'm um, happy to add some thoughts on, on top of that. And this is, uh, I devote quite a bit of discussion to this matter in the new climate war. Um, and really, you know, in my view, what we're seeing here is anytime a solution is put forward, uh, the usual suspects will attack it, they'll undermine it, they will campaign against it, they will create a groundswell of opposition. They've got the, the infrastructure and the money and the influence to do it. Um, they have the entire conservative media uh, to use now as, as, you know, as a cudgel. Um, in, and so what we've seen is when you know, cap and trade was uh, proposed as a solution, they said, no, we want a carbon tax. When carbon tax was proposed, they said, no, we want cap and trade. And now, there, now what's interesting is this idea that all carbon pricing, whether it's cap and trade or a, a carbon tax or even a revenue neutral carbon tax that should be attractive to conservatives, um, suddenly we're talking about, well, you know, that that's too difficult. What's only too difficult, you know, and Naomi understands this as well as anybody because they've been so effective at sabotaging any reasonable solutions that have been proposed. And they will do the same thing with subsidies. They are doing the same thing with subsidies. And so any attempt to solve this problem is going to find itself at the receiving end of a massive disinformation campaign by the fossil fuel industry. What we need are politicians who are willing to stand up to them. And so where I, you know, uh, I think Naomi and I are actually come down more or less in the same place. I see carbon pricing as a tool, but I see it as an essential tool. I do think we need uh, some sort of carbon pricing, be it tradable emissions, which worked very well with acid rain, worked very well, um, you know, with other past environmental problems. Uh, Australia passed uh, an emissions uh, trading scheme 
uh, a price on carbon and saw carbon emissions drop uh, 14% uh, within the first six months of implementation. It was so successful that the conservative government then um, uh, essentially deactivated. Uh, they campaigned against it. The Murdoch media in Australia vilified it and conservatives got in back into power and um, they uh, disbanded uh, the, the uh, emissions trading scheme. And so what you saw is it does work. Um, it's one of the tools in the toolbox and it does work. And in fact, it's the fact that it works that has led to conservative opposition and efforts to make it poisonous. And we've seen that in Canada when Canada, um, you know, when the, uh, uh, the uh, well, I don't want to say the liberal government because the words mean different things in different countries, but um, when the um, Trudeau, um, you know, uh, government uh, came out in support of uh, a carbon tax, uh, there was a massive disinformation campaign on social media that was absolutely tied to the same bad actors who have been trying to sabotage similar efforts here in the United States. The Yellow Vest um, uh, uh, revolt in, in France um, was tied to a social media campaign probably sourced from Russia. Same thing in Canada, same, th same here in the United States. And so those, you know, I talked about petrostates um, and Saudi Arabia and, and Russia are probably the two worst of them. And they have used all of these means at their disposal to make carbon taxes poisonous anywhere they've been tried out. They want them to be poisonous. They want us to look at that and say, no, the public won't accept it. Um, and so we have to, re you know, we have to recognize that, of course, there's going to be an effort to do that. That doesn't mean that we don't still go for it. Um, that has to be part of the toolbox. Uh, incentives for renewable energy have to be part of the toolbox. All those things should be on the table. And one of the things that I do find a, a little worrying is this belief now among some environmental progressives that pricing carbon is a bad thing because it buys into market economics, it buys into neoliberal um, you know, economics. Uh, and if you believe that capitalism is the problem, and there are ca climate campaigners who are absolutely convinced that capitalism is the problem, market economics is the problem, and you're going to oppose market mechanisms because of that, well, you know, then you have to ask yourself, are you trying to solve this problem within the framework that exists? Because I don't think we're overthrowing market economics in the next 10 years. I don't think we're overthrowing capitalism within the next 10 years. But as we know, that's the time scale on which we do need dramatic action on climate. So I come down sort of like Naomi, um, not cleanly in any one place, but recognizing that this is a fraught discussion, that there are a lot, a lot of bad actors right now that are trying to poison the waters. Um, and what we really need is political leadership. Um, if we get that political leadership, people, you know, politicians willing to make the tough decisions, willing to um, stand up to, you know, polluting interests, and, uh, you know, then, then we can see all of this move forward. We can see carbon pricing, we can see subsidies for renewables, incentives for renewables, um, and, you know, uh, the last thing, that's all sort of demand side. Supply side is really important, too. Um, and we've seen a lot of success there. And that's where campaigning uh, from grassroots activists has really made a difference. Um, the, you know, protests against uh, new fossil fuel infrastructure, pipelines, um, mountaintop removal, coal, um, that's having an impact. We're seeing now investors unwilling to invest in pipelines because there's so much opposition to it, uh, because of the threat of litigation if they go forward with it. And so, the activism by grassroots uh, on the sort of supply side has been made a, a, an important uh, sort of contribution here as well. So I would say recognize we need both supply side and demand side, stopping new fossil fuel infrastructure and diminishing demand by pricing carbon, leveling the play, playing field, doing whatever we need to do that. Okay, thank, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I just add one more thing on that. So, so I mean, I agree, I mean, Mike and I always, pretty much agree just sometimes say things in a slightly different way but i guess the one thing i'd like to underscore here though is about the politics of it because i think everything that mike said and everything i've written about adds up to that if you don't address the politics and the political opposition it doesn't matter how good your solution is and since a lot of our audience tonight are academics and this is being sponsored you know at mcgill university it's really important for us to understand i think there's a bit of a tendency in academic intellectual circles 
to do really good studies that really analyze in great detail, you know, is it better to have an emissions trading system or is it better to have, you know, a direct power and, and big fights about, you know, should it be revenue neutral or should we use the money to do this or that, right? And we get into the details and it's not that the details are wrong. Of course, they're, they're good to understand, but what we're missing often is that it doesn't matter what the details are if you're facing organized political opposition. And I think the French experience, you know, the fact that Macron, who's a very intelligent person, but yet somehow didn't think through the type of opposition that he was likely to face and wasn't ready for it. And so the whole thing turned into a, you know, a real mess for him, a real disaster. And I think that's what I'm getting at when I talk about the politics of it. It doesn't really matter what solution you propose if you're not prepared to anticipate and then be prepared for and fight back against the political opposition. And I think that's, that's something a lot of us in academia have not really, not really like taken to heart because we don't really like it. We don't want it to be political, but the reality is that it is. Yeah, no, amen. Uh, everything that Naomi just said. And, and one other thing on top of that, we often look at these um, academic studies that test sort of the attractiveness of different policies in a laboratory setting that has nothing to do with the real world where you do have these major actors who are poisoning the waters. And we, you know, what Naomi said, we have to sort of recognize that the real world implementation of policies is very different from the laboratory framework in which we think about policy sometimes in the academic world. That's, I, I like to think that's one thing that we do reasonably well in Canada is we, we take a look at the very strong academic work that Americans do, and then we apply it in the real world. Um, uh, and I'll just put in another plug for McGill and an, or, an initiative that, um, um, in fact, McGill, Trottier, and Ivy were all involved in, with it, which is something called the Eco Fiscal Commission, which, which did exactly what you described. It, um, it very successfully combined the research with the um, sort of depoliticizing the carbon price issue in Canada, and I think really pushed Canada to the forefront of, um, of carbon pricing. So I, I could not agree more with, with your assessment. Um, we're running short on time. I'm gonna ask one somewhat controversial question, partly because I legitimately just wanna know what you each think. And it did come up in our, our, our uh, questions here. What I'm looking at is the role of nuclear power. And you know, I'm hearing a lot about SMRs, small modular reactors, um, that you're, is that a, you're pushing that aside or? <laughs> no, I'm saying, Naomi, talk to Naomi. When people ask me about nuclear, uh, oh, I, okay. I normally refer to her uh, Boston Globe uh, op-ed uh, about oh, nuclear. Okay. She's on the other side of my computer screen. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> 180 degree. Uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Naomi, go for it. Well, nuclear power is such a strange technology because we've tried it and it failed. I mean, that's the bottom line. I mean, not failed completely. In the United States, we get about 20% of our power from nuclear France, but France is the only country in the world that has ever had the lion's share of its electricity from nuclear power. And they did it in a totally nationalized um, government run top down industry, not at in, all in a market-based economy, not at all. And it's the only place in the world that has worked. So one of the questions that I put to the advocate of nuclear power is this, is first of all, so are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to nationalize the electricity industry in the United States and have nuclear power be a government run industry? Because that is the only successful model we have for nuclear power. And usually when you pose the question that way, people are just dumbfounded because they haven't actually thought about that. What does it actually take to make nuclear power work? Second thing is nuclear power is incredibly expensive. And if you know anything about the French history, uh, strongly recommend to people the book, um, The Radiance of France by the historian Gabriel Heck, brilliant book that is in my experience, never read by the advocates of nuclear power. Um, she points out that France was willing to spend the money to have a nuclear power industry in part because de Gaulle was committed to an independent nuclear, French nuclear deterrent. He didn't wanna be dependent on NATO. So it was never cost competitive, not even in France. It's not cost competitive in the United States. Um, the only place where it's ever really been cost competitive is Japan, and we know what happened there. So this is a technology that has never been cost competitive, has never worked in a free market environment, and leaves us with a legacy of dangerous and toxic waste, which after 75 years, we still don't know what to do with. So that doesn't sound to me like a really great technology. <laughs> and so I just don't really understand. There's this kind of lure. It has this hold on people. And I think it's the lure 
of the silver bullet, the solution, the techno fix, you know, the beautiful technology, the city on the hill of technology, that if only we did this, our problems will all be solved. There is just no evidence from the history of this technology that that's correct. Now that said, I'm all about research. And if countries want to put some fraction of their research budget into trying to improve, you know, the so-called fourth generation nuclear modular you know, I think it's worth looking at. I don't think we should give up completely because there is a possibility that it could work. But, you know, Mike emphasized this idea of the 10 year time frame, which the IPCC has also been, been emphasizing. There's just no way that any of this is gonna happen in the next 10 years. The idea that we would finally solve the problem of nuclear waste, something we've been trying to do uh, since the 1950s and have not succeeded at, finally make it cost competitive, finally make it safe, and at the same time, generate public support because every public opinion poll shows that in the United States, people don't like nuclear power. Um, whether, whether that like not liking is rational or irrational, it's a fact, right? It is a fact that people don't like nuclear power. So to fix all those problems and change how people view it all within the next seven years, and then that doesn't even account for the lead time to build a plant. So it strikes me as incredibly unrealistic. And so I get a little hot under the collar when the advocates of nuclear power claim that they're the ones who are being realistic, because in fact, I think they're actually, um, they're living a kind of dream that the evidence, the history of this technology simply does not support. Yeah, just to we, add a, a few <laughs> thoughts. Yeah. We're just out of, I think we're running out of time, okay. um, Mike. I just want to um, maybe confirm with our hosts here, but um, according to my clock, we're uh, one minute past eight and I think we're wrapping up. Um, All right. uh, I don't know if- um, if, An opportunity uh, for just a very brief Yes, make a very, yes, please do. You know, much of my thinking about this has been greatly influenced by Naomi's work and Naomi's writing on this topic. And I've thought deeply about, you know, this disconnect, you know, if you look at it on paper, it is not a free market solution. It's not the sort of solution you would go for if you're a truly a free market conservative. So why do conservatives love this? Part of it is sort of the appeal of technology. And that is a, a theme that we see when it comes to conservative uh, solutions to climate change. There's this love of technology and techno fixes, geoengineering, et cetera. And I think this is part of that. But I also think it's just good old fashioned hippie bashing. I mean, who was it who was against <laughs> nuclear energy and, uh, and, and, and nuclear arms in the 70s. It was these progressives. It was these greenies. And so it's this aversion to that among conservatives that I think has led them to, you know, it's my enemy's enemy must be my friend sort of thinking. And, uh, you know, conservatives like Bob Inglis, who uh, we both know, who's a former, you know, very Republican congressman from South Carolina, who uh, now advocates for sort of conservative approaches to dealing with climate change. And, um, and he's pointed this out. He says, look, you know, this just doesn't make sense on paper, conservatives. Nuclear doesn't make sense as a solution. Why is it? that there's so much support among conservatives. And, and I think it does just come down to good old fashioned uh, sort of uh, uh, political history to some extent. Yep, yep, and, and yeah, very much ideological. Um, I'm, I, I could uh, really just keep going on and on here and I suspect our audience could, but um, I'm getting the, uh, the, the final warning uh, signs so um, I would like to thank you so much, um, Naomi and Mike, really, really um, great presentations and then a great conversation. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, Subasis to um, uh, wind up for us this evening. To everyone joining us here tonight, your present confirms your personal commitment to take action on the greatest challenge that is facing our planet. A huge thank you to Naomi, Michael and Bruce for an engaging evening. I would also like to thank you, the event organizers and the teams at TISED, IET and McGill. This event and our many initiatives are made possible by a generous gift from the Trottier Family Foundation. Our deepest thank to the Trottier family for their leadership and generosity in supporting our institute and so many other initiatives at McGill and elsewhere. Before we end, I'd just like to bring your attention to another upcoming event 
and you will see all of the details here on the screen. The event is the Trottier Public Science Symposium hosted by the McGill Office of Science and Society. It's a two-day event held on the 19th and 26th of October. And the theme of the event is, in whom do we trust? So with that, good evening, bonsoir.